every vision system you develop is going to use a camera. Knowing how that camera operates is going to make you much better at machine vision. So let's get started by going into the camera to examine how the camera senses light. Here we are at the input of the camera where the lens mounts. Let's look at the image sensor more closely. Closer, closer, and still closer. There, that's one light sensing element out of the array of light sensing elements in the image sensor. To understand how it works, we're going to draw on what you learned in the video series on light and the photoelectric effect. We'll be covering more on basic semiconductor physics, two different light sensing structures used in image sensors, quantum efficiency, and dark current. If you haven't had the opportunity to watch the videos on light, you might want to start by watching those before continuing with this video. This video builds on what is covered in those videos. Let's look into some basic semiconductor principles for silicon. Silicon is the most common semiconductor used for making image sensors. Here is a representation of silicon as a crystal structure. While silicon is really a three-dimensional crystal, for simplicity it's shown here as a two-dimensional structure. You will notice that silicon has four electrons in its valence band. Each of these electrons forms a bond with a neighboring atom. This is called intrinsic silicon, and it's actually not a very good conductor of electricity. Suppose, though, we remove a silicon atom and replace it with an arsenic atom. In semiconductor processing, this is called doping. Arsenic atoms have five electrons in their valence band. Four of these valence electrons form bonds with neighboring silicon atoms, just like the silicon atom we removed. The fifth arsenic atom electron is not bonded. It takes very little electrical energy to raise this unbonded electron from the valence band into the conduction band, where it can move around and conduct electricity. Although the doped silicon is still electrically neutral, it has the same number of protons with positive charge as electrons with negative charge. It is called n-type material because the electrons, which are free to move, have a negative charge. What do you think will happen if we take this n-type material and put a battery across it? The battery's positive lead attracts the free electrons in the material. However, this leaves the material positively charged and this positive charge attracts electrons from the battery's negative lead. This process continues and causes a current to flow. If we start again with our intrinsic silicon structure and again remove one of the silicon atoms, but this time replace it with a boron atom that has three electrons in its valence band, we get something different. The three boron electrons form bonds with the electrons in the silicon structure. Silicon, though, still wants four electrons to complete the four bonds. In effect, it has a hole that would like to accept an electron if one were available. Even though the material is electrically neutral with the same number of electrons and protons, the hole behaves like a positive charge that is free to move around in the material. This is called p-type material, the p standing for positive. What happens if we connect a battery across a block of p-type material? Holes in the p-type material accept electrons from the negative battery contact. This leaves the material negatively charged, and excess electrons are swept towards the positive battery contact. Again, we have current flow. In this p-type material, the holes appear to migrate towards the negative battery contact. They act as if they were positive charges. If we have two pieces of semiconductor, one doped to be n-type and the other doped to be p-type, we may notice that the carriers in each piece move around randomly just due to thermal energy. 
What happens if we bring these two materials together so the crystal structure is continuous? Some of the electrons will drift from the N material into the P material, and some of the holes will drift from the P material into the N material. At the junction of the two materials, which were initially electrically neutral, the N material gains some holes and becomes positively charged, and the P material gains some electrons and becomes negatively charged. The result is an electrical potential across the junction. At some point, the electrical potential becomes large enough to inhibit further flow of carriers, holes, and electrons across the junction. You should also notice that the silicon around the junction has no available carriers, neither holes or electrons. This area is called the depletion region. The depletion region with the electrical potential across it is important to us in understanding how photosensors work. What happens if we connect a battery to our joined semiconductor material? First, with the positive lead connected to the P material and the negative lead connected to the N material. Prior to connecting the battery, the P material gains some electrons, or negative carriers, that are now attracted to the positive battery lead. Likewise, the N material has some holes, or positive carriers, that are attracted to the negative battery lead. The flow of carriers reduces the number near the junction, which in turn reduces the voltage potential across the junction, allowing more carriers to move. Current flows continuously. This is called forward bias. Now, if we reverse the battery connections, so the positive lead is connected to the end material and the negative lead is connected to the P material, this increases the potential across the junction enlarges the depletion region, and blocks carriers from moving across the junction. So a semiconductor PN junction is a diode. It allows current to flow in one direction, but not in the reverse direction. What is important to take away from this discussion is that across a reverse bias junction, there is a depletion region. The depletion region is free of carriers and has a voltage potential across it. Any carrier that comes into the depletion region is swept out of it by this voltage. Before leaving semiconductor physics, let's look at the very basic steps in fabricating a semiconductor device. The process begins with a wafer of silicon that is heavily doped. The next step is to grow a more lightly doped layer on top of the wafer. This top layer is where the actual semiconductor devices will be fabricated. Into this layer, other impurities are introduced to change n-type material to p-type or p-type material to n-type to build the desired regions either side by side or one on top of another. The process grows a layer of insulation material called passivation on top. Usually this layer is something like silicon dioxide. Holes are etched through the passivation to reach the silicon. Finally, metal is selectively placed to make contact with the silicon and form conductors. Here are the takeaways from this short discussion on semiconductor physics. Intrinsic silicon can be doped with an element from group 5, such as arsenic, and make it into n-type material. We can dope the silicon with elements from group 3, like boron, and make it into p-type material. N-type material has electrons available to conduct electricity. P-type silicon has holes available to conduct electricity as if they were positive charges. If N and P-type material are in contact, they form a P-N junction. Charges in the vicinity of the junction migrate until a potential is created that prevents any further charge migration. The migration of carriers across the junction creates a depletion region that is free of available carriers. Now you are ready to combine what you know about semiconductors with what you learned in the video courses on light to see how an image sensor senses light. When a photon is incident on semiconductor material, in this case n-type material, 
it transfers energy to one of the free electrons in the valence band, elevating the electron from the valence band into the conduction band. That elevated electron is now free to move around. Eventually, if nothing happens to it, the electron will return to the valence band and release its excess energy as heat. Consider a p-n junction where the top electrical contact is transparent. Let's call this a photodiode. If the battery is switched on momentarily, the battery's voltage reverse biases the p-n junction. This creates a large depletion region. As we discussed earlier, the depletion region has an electric field across it. Now when a photon comes in and is absorbed in the depletion region, it frees an electron. The freed electron is swept out of the depletion region, but remains captured in the silicon. In this way, the photodiode accumulates the photogenerated charge. There is another structure that can be used to capture light. That is the MOS capacitor. MOS stands for Metal Oxide Semiconductor. Imagine you have a piece of p-type material and on top of it you grow an insulating layer. Now you apply a voltage to the top and bottom. This electric field repels the holes in the semiconductor, leaving the silicon in that region positively charged and depleted of carriers. When photons are absorbed in the depletion region, they create freed electrons that are held or accumulated by the voltage across the depletion region. Here's what you should remember. There are two kinds of light sensors used in our image sensors, the photodiode and the MOS capacitor. It's not important that you know which kind is used in your image sensor because they both sense light in a similar way. You are interested, though, in the performance of the image sensor itself. If the light sensor created one photogenerated charge for each incident photon, it would be said to have 100% quantum efficiency. Many people shorten quantum efficiency to QE. Because quantum efficiency is a key specification for every image sensor, we will examine its real meaning for machine vision. Later we will look into what prevents image sensors from achieving 100% quantum efficiency. Ideally what you want is that every incident photon creates an accumulated electron. As we discussed, this would be 100% quantum efficiency. This graph shows an ideal quantum efficiency versus wavelength, but you notice that it goes to zero at 1100 nanometers. That's because photons with wavelengths longer than 1100 nanometers do not have enough energy to an excite an electron in silicon from the valence band into the conduction band. For silicon image sensors, we really cannot expect to have any quantum efficiency at all for light with wavelengths longer than 1100 nanometers. But there's more to consider. We really cannot achieve 100% quantum efficiency. What you know from the video sequence on optics is that some light is going to reflect off the surface of silicon. There is an equation for that reflection. The equation relies on knowing the indices of refraction on either side of the surface. Assume air has an index of 1 and silicon has an index of 3.5. The formula works out to where we are going to reflect or lose about 31% of the incident light energy. That is, only 69% of the photons are actually going to penetrate into the silicon where they have the possibility of creating a photogenerated charge. Photons of shorter wavelengths tend to be absorbed more quickly in silicon and penetrate only a short distance. They have a higher likelihood of being absorbed into the depletion region than longer wavelength photons. Photons of longer wavelength tend to penetrate deeper into the silicon, often beyond the depletion region. While they may cause an electron to be freed, the electron is likely to recombine with the silicon before wandering into the depletion region where it could be captured. If we take these factors of photon energy as a function of wavelength, reflection from the surface, and the expected penetration depth of a photon into consideration, we end up with a quantum efficiency that is less than 100%. 
This graph shows a QE that is a rough representation of what is characteristic of some image sensors. You will see quantum efficiency specified for many image sensors and many cameras. My experience shows me that what I want is actually a plot of camera output as a function of wavelength for a constant level of light energy. This is the responsivity, or more correctly, the spectral responsivity of the camera. Recall from the videos on optics that we have a formula that gives us the energy of a photon as the function of its wavelength. If there is a fixed energy of light, we can compute the number of photons, given that formula. Let's quickly calculate what this would be for several wavelengths. We'll create a table and assume a certain fixed energy level. For each wavelength, we'll calculate the number of photons and the relative output of an ideal image sensor with a quantum efficiency of 100%. We can plot these points on a graph to see what our ideal camera output would be. We notice that the output declines as the wavelength gets shorter. This is because there are fewer photons needed at shorter wavelengths to achieve the constant light energy. To find out how the camera will really perform, we take the ideal response and multiply that by the camera's quantum efficiency. This gives us the camera's spectral responsivity, that is, what the camera's output will be for a fixed amount of energy as a function of wavelength. The takeaway is that while most camera specifications give you the quantum efficiency, what you really want to know as a camera user is the camera's spectral responsivity. To finish up our basic understanding of photosensors in an image sensor, let's look at another characteristic called dark current. Here is a PN junction with its depletion region. The carriers, although separated by the depletion region, have thermal energy. Over time, some of the carriers will manage to leak across the depletion region. The amount of leakage depends on several factors. The photosensitive area, the doping of the semiconductor material, the camera's exposure time, and the temperature. In an image sensor, this leakage appears as a signal as if light were incident on the sensor even when the sensor is in total darkness. That's why it's called dark current. As a user of a camera, you have some control over dark current in two ways. The exposure time. Longer exposures increase the magnitude of dark current proportionately. The camera's temperature. The dark current doubles for every 8 degrees Celsius rise in temperature, as shown in the graph. Here's what to remember about dark current. It is due to basic semiconductor physics. It is not an issue for many machine vision applications. It can become a concern when operating in hot environments, when needing long exposure times, or when needing very high dynamic range. In this video, you've covered some very basic information about semiconductor physics as it relates to sensing light. Two different semiconductor structures used for sensing light, the photodiode and the MOS capacitor. Quantum efficiency that tells us how good the image sensor is at sensing light. And dark current, a signal component that exists even in the absence of light. Now you are ready to view the next video that covers CCD image sensors.